The top business store is live from the Sky News City studio. A new survey suggests UK companies are considerably more confident than their European counterparts. Also ahead, a winter warning. One of Europe's infrastructure giants tells Sky News we are not fully prepared for another energy crisis. And finding those hard-to-reach places, how more governments around the world are navigating difficult terrains by pinpointing locations. Good morning, this is Business Live with me, Ian King. We begin with a new survey published this morning that suggests British business leaders are considerably more optimistic than their counterparts on continental Europe. The quarterly Business Outlook report compiled by Accenture and S&P found that a net 40% of UK firms expect to see activity continue to grow over the coming year. That was slightly down on the last reading of 43% in February, but significantly ahead of the European reading of 19%. The Irish Republic was the only country where businesses were more positive than in the UK. Well, joining me now to talk about this is Rachel Barton. She's Europe's strategy lead for Accenture. Rachel, welcome to you. What's behind this positivity, do you think? Thank you very much for having me on the show, Ian. It's great to be here. Um, as you said, we're seeing robust levels of confidence in the UK at the moment, and I would feel very encouraged because what's behind that are maybe three things I'd like to highlight. The first is that UK sentiment is turning to growth. We're seeing investment in the development of new products and services. We're also seeing huge strides in new technologies like artificial intelligence. In fact, UK companies have doubled their expectations around investing in this kind of tech in the last year. And thirdly, we are seeing the first time since early 2022 increased um, investment in research and development. So I would feel very encouraged by these findings because UK companies, while they've been resilient and adaptable thus far, are really investing in taking cost out, increasing productivity and using new technologies to compete on the global stage. Well, we'll, we'll get on to some of those uh, matters in a couple of moments, Rachel. But first, I wanted just to ask you about what you found out about inflation, because it appears that inflation expectations are high, but they're coming down. They are. And businesses are facing a difficult environment with rising costs to contend with. We've absolutely seen that, though the inflation outlook does look like it's gone down a little bit since February, which is important if we're going to have economic stability. That inflation is largely coming through staff costs and three quarters of the firms that we surveyed were expecting the rising cost of living and also labour shortages to drive that kind of inflation. I think what's positive, though, is that while we are seeing these inflationary pressures hit, as firms invest in technologies to drive automation, they are Ma managing how much cost they actually pass on to the consumer. And we are indeed seeing, you know, a calibration, I would say, of the profit um, that companies are expecting to make and how they are managing that in line with cost um, preservation. Yeah, I mean, that's very, very interesting. It, it looks as though a majority of companies are able to pass on the uh, cost increases that they're, they're getting. They are. Um, but I think what was reassuring is that while we see increased cost in some raw materials, particularly in the manufacturing sectors like metals, timber, um, chemicals, we are seeing um, firms pass on those costs in, I would say, a slightly more conservative way than they were thinking about a year ago. And because they are optimising the bottom line, they're still able to maintain a level of investment capacity that allows them to fund growth. And, and that will be important to balance. Now, clearly, if these inflationary pressures continue, we might see different responses when we do the survey next time. But I think business has been resilient to manage that over the course of the last few months. Now, you mentioned just now the fact that uh, R&D expenditure appears to be on the increase. I mean, business investment has obviously been a real Achilles heel for, for many, many years for this economy. Why do you think things are starting to improve on that front? Well, I was very encouraged to see that investment in research and development has turned positive for the first time since early 2022. But there is a word of caution because the levels of R&D investment in the UK are still lower 
than we see across Europe. So I would really encourage UK business to think about how they compete on that global stage and how they use innovative technologies to be able to find new ways to differentiate themselves. I mean, when I talk to business leaders uh, in private equity, for example, they are looking at generative AI as a way of being much more precise around investment opportunities for their new um, uh, portfolio companies. In consumer goods, we've seen massive investment into resilient supply chains using innovative technologies to be able to create that certainty in the movement of goods and services. That's the kind of investment that we need so that bolder strategies can be created and we can start to see this growth now get converted. It's a really important point you just made there, Rachel. You, you think that this R&D spend is actually on generating growth in, in future. This isn't simply R&D playing catch up with uh, R&D spending that has been foregone in previous months and years. Well, that's absolutely what's come through from the survey results that... Uh, in the construction sector, for example, we saw plans around green infrastructure, green tech. Um, in uh, consumer goods, we've seen resilient supply chains come through. We are seeing organisations take bolder strategies that are more informed by technology to essentially put the push the boundaries on what they think they're capable of. Now, clearly, we need to see that convert. And I would really encourage businesses to keep the investment in these new innovative technologies, to be careful in how they manage those wage um, rises and inflation, to continue to take costs out on one end of the business, but also maximise productivity and innovate to differentiate on the other. And uh, briefly, if you would, please, Rachel, obviously this is a pan-European uh, survey that you've done. Are there any glimmers of hope for continental Europe? I mean, obviously, the Irish Republic's doing very well. What about the rest of Europe? Yeah, Ireland has um, consistently been the most positive country that we've seen across Ireland. Not, not followed that far behind by the UK. But Spain actually has been pretty consistent since the last survey, largely because of hospitality and increased expectations around tourism. We are seeing France and Germany um, talk of geopolitical challenges, um, the impact, the secondary impact of supply chain issues coming from the Ukraine war. So we know that that creates a slight dampening of confidence in parts of continental Europe. But I think we should feel um, positive in that those levels of confidence, while we've seen dramatic highs and lows over the last few years, have, re uh, have managed to maintain in a fairly steady uh, curve um, since February. All right, Rachel, we've got to leave it there. Good to talk to you this Monday morning. Thank you. Thank you. Now, Europe is ill-prepared for another energy crisis this winter. That's the warning from Schneider Electric, the 91 billion euro French multinational that uses automation and software to help its customers use energy more efficiently. I've been speaking with Philippe Delorme, who's Schneider Electric's executive vice president of Europe operations. You took this position just before the start of the war in Ukraine. How has Europe adapted to the loss of Russian gas? Well, it's been a real challenge. If you look at really the big pictures, so the war in Ukraine and the tension with Russia has resulted into a 20% shortfall in the energy system in Europe, so 20% less supply. So when you have a situation like this, either you produce more, which takes a lot of time, or you use less, which is energy efficiency. I would say we've done some energy efficiency in the past months, but really not enough to be secure for the coming winter. So we still are in front of, a, I would call it a major energy crisis, and still a lot of work to do. So Europe is ill-prepared for another energy crisis this winter? Yeah, I don't think so. I think we have really a, a massive problem in front of us. I think there will be tension across the summer. I mean, June has been very, very warm. Heating and cooling and cooling in the, in the case of summer is going to be, let's say, ramping up. So it's going to put tension, which will consume energy. And then we're going to go into win winter. And we think that there will be still very, very strong tension across the system in Europe. So are there any silver bullets that can be fired? Is there anything that can be done in the immediate short term? So the easiest silver bullet is energy efficiency. You know, if we make the analogy with the COVID, the silver bullet for the COVID was a vaccine. Somewhat I like to say energy efficiency is the best vaccine for the energy crisis. 
it's not a perfect silver bullet because maybe it takes slightly more time than the vaccine, but actually it's the fastest way, the fastest fuel, alternative fuel for the 20% energy we're missing in Europe. Are governments around Europe doing enough to encourage and incentivize energy efficiency? I think they are trying their best, but there is really a figure that I think is very striking. In the past 12 months, we spent 800 billion euro of fuel subsidies. So just to subsidize fuel that where the, the, the cost was too high, which is like you subsidize the past, you throw money by the window, and we've not spent this money to accelerate energy efficiency. So there is a lot of attention, a lot of goodwill, but the massive mobilization on the energy system of tomorrow is not there yet. Is the problem with household consumption of energy? Because obviously businesses have their own built-in incentives yeah. to be more efficient. So if you look at the big picture, 40% of energy is in building, 40% in industry, 20% transportation. So in the 40% of building, roughly one third is residential, two thirds is larger building and data center. So we like houses because they, they speak to us, but actually the large majority of the rest of energy is with large buildings, data centers, industry and mobility. Looking at the UK in particular, how, how do you compare the UK's energy efficiency with that of continental Europe? So actually the UK has started pretty early and has worked quite a bit on energy efficiency and on another topic which is very interesting, which is energy flexibility. So when you have a problem in your energy system, meaning demand exceeds supply, either you structurally consume less or you absorb the peak by asking people to shed their loads, that the flexibility system, so-called demand response. UK is today the most advanced country across Europe to put in place those systems. And I think the rest of Europe should take UK as an example to accelerate this thing, which is actually one very smart silver bullet to avoid blackout across Europe. And obviously, Joe Biden's incentivizing green energy to the tune of $369 billion. Is Europe in a position to match that in any way? Uh, no, and I would say Europe is taking, you know, Europe is putting more laws while actually the US is putting in place more money. So, and I'm not saying that what Europe is doing is not good. I'm just saying it's not enough incentive with money, too many laws and not enough speed. Is there a danger that the incentives that the US is offering, though, is going to lead to an inefficient allocation of capital? Uh, there is that risk and I would say there is really a risk in Europe to lose competitiveness in industry which would be a massive risk for jobs because industry provides a lot of jobs and if plants are being shut down in Europe and being opened in the US that's going to be a massive economic problem for Europe. Some other business news stories for you now. And Microsoft has come another step closer to winning approval for its $69 billion takeover of games publisher Activision Blizzard. It signed a deal with rival Sony that would keep Call of Duty, Activision Blizzard's best-selling title, on the Sony PlayStation in the event of the deal going through. The agreement is significant because the Japanese company has been the deal's biggest opponent and raised concerns that Microsoft would use its market power to put Call of Duty exclusively on its own gaming platform, Xbox. The rate at which China's economy grew slowed down during the second quarter of the year. Chinese GDP during the three months to the end of June was up by 0.8% on the first three months of the year. That was better than the half of 1% growth that had been expected, but was still weaker than the 2.2% quarter-on-quarter growth enjoyed during the first three months of the year. On a year-on-year -year basis, Chinese GDP grew by 6.3% during the quarter, making it the best three months since the same period in 2021. But economists pointed out the figures were flattered by comparison with a period last year, during which much of China was in lockdown. The asset management firm Gresham House has agreed to a takeover, valuing it at £469.9 million. The buyer is the investment firm from the United States, Searchlight Capital, as was first reported last night by Sky City editor Mark Kleinman. Gresham House, which has assets under management worth nearly £8 billion, was founded in 1857 and specialises in so-called alternative assets, including forestry, battery storage, sustainable infrastructure and housing. It's also manager of some of the UK's best-known venture capital trusts, including Barrowsmead and Mobius. 
And the furniture retailer DFS said this morning it had raised its share of the market to 38%, in spite of the market being, in its words, significantly worse than expected. The company, which also owns the Sophology brand and trades from 118 showrooms in the UK and Ireland, said it expected underlying profits would come in at slightly above £30 million for the year to the end of June, in line with previous guidance. It said that was despite volumes in the UK furniture market falling by between 15 and 20% during the year. A bit of breaking news to, uh, to bring you now. Uh, we've just uh, been told that Sir Elton John and his husband, David Furnish, have been called as witnesses in the Kevin Spacey trial. The trial's been taking place, of course, at Southern Crown Court. The 63-year-old is accused of charges, including sexual assault and indecent assault against four men in the UK, which he denies. Well, the oil price has had something of a roller coaster morning. It spiked overnight on a Reuters report that Saudi Arabia had extended its production cuts. Reuters subsequently, about six hours later, in fact, said this was a repeat of a story from the 4th of June published in Erin. The price came rattling back after that. A barrel of Brent crude will currently set you back $78.60 a barrel. That's off just over 1.5% on the day. On the equity market, stocks in the Asia-Pacific region saw mixed trade overnight on the uh, GDP data. Not really uh, very encouraging uh, for the region there. That's also depressed stocks in Europe this morning as well. Here's the main picture. All of the main European indices in negative territory right now. Talking points this morning include Richemont, the Swiss luxury goods group. They're the people behind Montclair and Montblanc. Uh, the shares down 9% uh, in Paris. On the, in Zurich, sorry, on the news of a drop in quarterly sales in the United States. Here in London, the FTSE 100 is off a third of 1% right now. The oil and mining heavyweights, which, of course, are heavily dependent on China, they're dragging on the index again. There are not too many individual features to mention, or indeed gainers for that matter, but one of the few that is up is Johnson Matthey, the uh, precious metals and industrial materials group. The share's up nearly 1% there after it benefited from broker comments. The gaming group Entain, the owners of Labbrooks and Coral, of course, it's off 1% after announcing the £81 million acquisition of the US sports betting business Angstrom. On the foreign exchange market, so while the US dollar remains close to a 15-month low against the pound, more or less unchanged right now across the uh, piece there, all the main currency pairs sterling very, very marginally higher against the greenback, but really not much in it. Well, joining me now is Julian Lafarge. He's the chief market strategist at Barclays Private Bank. Julian, good to see you this morning. Obviously, the big event last week was the US inflation data, and that's kind of uh, supported uh, the mood into this week, I guess. Yeah, very much so. Um, it, was, it was the perfect report. Um, the market was expecting some kind of a cool down. It happened. Um, obviously, we've seen a significant moderation in inflation going up from 9% to, to, to 3% now. Um, and this is the market. And, and the Fed's biggest problem at the moment is, is inflation. So seeing inflation coming uh, closer, not yet at, but closer to uh, the Fed target is, is clearly a welcome news. Now, there, was, there are a lot of base effect behind that. And the next few months, it might be a bit trickier from an inflation standpoint. Uh, but forced to say that, that the Fed so far seems to have accomplished its mission of uh, bringing inflation down while keeping the economy operating at a decent pace. Now, obviously, uh, earnings season for the second quarter got in underway last week. Uh, some decent numbers from some of the banks on uh, Friday afternoon. Uh, yeah, so far, so far, so good for for earnings season. I think the uh, the key question is not so much around this part of of the economy. Um, we 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 get updates from them on on a regular basis, uh, and it's easy to get a sense as to how they're doing. Um, very happy to see that although they are taking some more provisions so far, they don't seem to be too worried about uh, the shape of the the U.S. economy and the U.S. consumer in particular. Uh, where we really want to pay attention to are, are two specific areas. One is um, technology, um, in light of the strong performance that some of those stocks have had on a year-to-day basis. They need to follow up now. And the second is on the more cyclical part of the the, um, the market, the industrials in particular, um, to see how they're uh, experiencing what has been the sign of a significant slowdown in manufacturing so far this year and to see if they're seeing any sign of a rebound coming ahead. Very good point you make there on manufacturing. How, how worried are you by the, the Chinese GDP data that came out overnight? 
Um, worried and not worried. I think I think expectations on China have been wrong the whole way uh, since they uh, reopened. Uh, people were expecting seven percent GDP growth at some point. Uh, we have to remember that China was basically under some kind of restriction for three years. And and when you reopen an economy that has been under restriction for three years, you would expect not as much of a jump as what we've experienced in the UK or, or in Europe or in the US, simply because you don't stay at home for three years. The economy kept uh, moving on. So the, the rebound has been relatively mild compared to expectation. Clearly, China is uh, fighting as well a real estate issue. Um, I think that the, the calls for more uh, stimulus are, are growing louder by, by the day, um, and they will have uh, Chinese authority will have to do something at some point. So uh, it's just a matter of when, uh, not if, we will see more more stimulus. And I don't think uh, China is, is by any means collapsing uh, or slowing down or halting to a grind. I think I think is it's okay the type of uh, growth that we're seeing because the reopening was marginal to some degree. All right, Julian, there's lots more I wanted to ask you, but we're out of time, I'm afraid. We'll uh, have to do it another time. Good to see you today. Thank you. Still to come here on Business Live, I'll be speaking to the CEO of the British tech startup. What three words? It's just struck a major deal with the Mongolian government. Stay with us. I'm Mark Stone and I'm Sky's correspondent based here in Washington, D.C. Oh, street. Oh, street. Well, the plan seems to be to head to the police station where the policeman who fired the shots was based. And everything you know, his memories is all gone. In almost every corner, this town has been completely destroyed by the fire. I've witnessed the remarkable passion for politics here, but the anger too. We have to get Trump out of the White House. Is this the moment to reform gun laws? You know, it's, it's easy to go to politics. But it's important. It's at the heart of the issue. I, I get that that's where the media likes to go. No, it's not. It's where many of the people we've talked to here like to go. I report on the biggest stories from around the world. This is a town that is effectively encircled by the Russians. You say it's all fabrication, what's happening in Butcher. Destroyed my nation. We take you to the heart of stories that shape our planet. Oh, yeah, I can hear now quite a few explosions uh, in the distance here in Jerusalem. A very violent series of confrontations here. What do you think of ISIS? Everybody here know the truth of ISIS. It's like better. Fly Emirates, fly better. Thank you. 
Welcome back. Now, a British tech company whose service is widely used by the emergency services here has struck a deal with the Mongolian government. Under the agreement, the What Three Words app will be used by the Mongolian Postal Service and tourism authorities to help find their way around a country no different or is the difficult to navigate by conventional means. What Three Words works by dividing up the planet's surface into portions each measuring three square metres and assigning a three-word address to each of them, replacing traditionally confusing grid references. Well, with me in the studio now is Chris Sheldrick. He's the CEO and co-founder of What Three Words. Chris, welcome to you. How did this deal come about? Um, so we've been in Mongolia for a little while. We actually have a team of 21 people based there. But um, it, after doing an initial deal with the Mongolian government with the Postal Service a few years ago, um, they wanted to really ramp up. They have an app now called eMongolia. And I think they've seen what we've done here in the UK with so many of our government emergency services using What Three Words, and they wanted to then go from post and expand into other things. So with eMongolia, if you need a passport delivered to you or something like that, if you have no conventional address, very, very difficult to get found. Um, and so through eMongolia and through tourism, they now think that What Three Words can be used for pretty much anything you want to do around location um, in Mongolia. And that's the point. There, there aren't a lot of conventional uh, addresses in this country. Uh, no, that's fair to say. I mean, it's an absolutely enormous space. Um, but if you go there in the way that we would have a normal address, um, a street number, that's very, very rare in Mongolia. So people use directions, they'll use the ne nearest place name. But as the country gets increasingly digitised, it's very, very, um, it takes a very long time to put in place a new address system from scratch. So it's uh, only like what three words, it's just ready instantly. Are there other territories out there that have similar characteristics to Mongolia? Um, yes, absolutely. And in fact, I came back through some other Central Asian countries on the way home. I think plenty of other countries share those issues. Uh, we recently signed a deal in Vietnam as well with the postal service there. Um, again, on-demand economy surging, but unless you've got an address system uh, ready to go, which in Vietnam is still developing, um, they want something which is, which is instant, um, and we're one of the, really the only people who can provide that. I mean, you're in a number of overseas markets now, the US, Australia, France, Germany. Where are you seeing growth most rapid? So I think it's a mixture of both, um, and that's the thing. So with automakers for car navigation, um, again, people speaking addresses into their cars often been a very, very sore point uh, with consumers. So there we see Japan, the USA, Germany, um, a lot of deals being done for car navigation. But in terms of logistics and e-commerce, deliveries and government, it's, it's the emerging markets where the address uh, infrastructure is, is far less developed. Do you vary what you charge customers from territory to territory and from industry sector to industry sector? So what through it is, has a very standard um, pricing. Uh, for emergency services, we offer it for free. It doesn't matter where in the world you are. Um, but actually, our pricing is very standardised. It uh, doesn't matter where you are, as is normally the case with addressing services. Right, it, even though there must be some users of the service who are more intense than others. Uh, yes, yeah, so, so all of our pricing is done in terms of transaction volume as anything else. Um, but for consumers, if you're a consumer of the What3Words what app or any of our services, you'll never pay anything. So for, for your consumer, wherever you go in the world, um, everything is free. And are all the, the three words always in English around the world? Uh, no, definitely not. So we offer 55 different language versions of What3Words, what so including Mongolian, including Vietnamese. Um, so wherever you go, you should be able to uh, navigate, we believe, using your own language. So in fact, if you go to Mongolia as a tourist, uh, you should take the Lonely Planet Travel Guide. You'll find every single place you want to go to has got three words in English, which you'll probably find easier than uh, using the Mongolian version. But similarly, a Mongolian tourist in the UK can happily use the Mongolian version. Have you had any cases where people have objected to the words that you use to, to find their address? Um, I mean, occasionally, but, but very rarely, I think. Generally speaking, people uh, using our app, and as you mentioned in the beginning, it's three metres by three metres. It's pretty small. Um, and I know that a lot of uh, consumers, they will just click on a couple of squares maybe to find the ones that they prefer. Uh, but it also makes it interesting, um, but it, I guess it highlights the fact that it's very precise that our squares are so small. It is. I mean, you, you can have hours of fun just uh, looking at different locations and finding out what words uh, describe your address. You can, and I'd actively encourage people to do that because I think it's something which makes it a lot more engaging than using postcodes, coordinates or something else. Um, even kids, the grandparents, will, will have um, endless hours just um, finding how our system works just by clicking in their front garden uh, somewhere around the back or their favourite places. Um, but it's good. It sticks in your mind. It's only three words, and that's kind of the key to what we do. It's simplicity. All right, Chris. Well, three words for you. We're out of time. Actually, that was four, wasn't it? Good to see you today. Thanks, Thanks for joining much, me. Ian. That's it for me. I'm back at half past four this afternoon. I hope very much to see you then. We'll have all the latest from the markets. Catch you later. Cheerio.